the Alaska class were part of a general wave of design started in the mid-1930s that all owed their origins to the Deutschland class. With the latter ship's designed intent to be able to kill anything they couldn't run from, and run anything they couldn't kill, and pray that renowned Repulse and Hood didn't get involved, the idea of a cruiser killer began to circulate through the minds of various major navies. Of course, the French built the Dunkirk class in response to the Deutschlands, and the Germans built the Scharnhorst in response to the Dunkirks. So, a trend of ships with intermediate caliber weapons and varying degrees of armour was already being established. With the general collapse of naval treaties starting in the mid-1930s and accelerating into the late 1930s, the Americans began to receive speculative reports that Japan was planning its own class of supercruisers. The period of treaty restrictions having ostensibly made most Navy's cruiser fleets a known quantity in terms of protection, weaponry and speed. It was therefore theoretically possible to design a bigger vessel with heavier guns that could, despite having relatively small numbers, run down and wipe out almost any hostile cruiser. Something which most people agreed would appeal to the otherwise numerically inferior Japanese Navy. If this all sounds a little bit familiar, that's because it's pretty much exactly the same rationale that had gone into the development of the first battle cruisers. And indeed, the terms supercruiser, cruiser killer, and battle cruiser were all used interchangeably at the time to describe the various ships. As it turned out, the Japanese would eventually finalise the B-65 class design, although ironically enough in response to the American design, since they don't appear to actually have had such plans at the time the Alaskas were designed. And the Russians would try the Stalingrad Grad and Kronstadt combination. Uh, the Germans had considered the P class and O class, and the British would produce numerous designs, including a miniature original flavour King George V with 9.2 inch guns. So in short, everyone was at it at various points in the uh, mid to late 1930s and going forward, with many designs following approximately the same lines. It seemed that it was open season on cruiser-killing capital ships, and so of course America had to get in on this action. Fortunately, in this particular department they had something of an advantage, somewhat akin to the high seas fleet in the run-up to World War I, in that they knew that their potential enemies either had built, were building, or were planning to build such ships, and so they could design their own ships to counter both treaty-era cruisers and, to a certain degree, the other cruiser killers they knew about. Almost a cruiser-killer killer. Unfortunately, the early design process was a classic example of design by committee, resulting in a whole slew of designs that ranged bizarrely from an enlarged and, if you can believe it, somewhat even more overgunned version of the Atlanta, I'm not entirely sure what that was supposed to do, through a series of designs that resembled somewhat enlarged treaty cruisers, all the way up to a ship that displaced more than a treaty battleship, but was armed more along the lines of a second generation dreadnought, with a battery of a dozen 12-inch guns. In an effort to control the size, and therefore the cost, of the ships, the General Board stated that cruiser levels of underwater protection would be acceptable. In the long term, this would leave the ships very vulnerable to torpedo, mine, and underwater shell impacts for vessels of their size. But, regardless of the strange designs considered, the final design was actually a surprisingly simple concept, at least on paper simply run the basic layout of the Baltimore-class heavy cruisers through the scaling machine at about 125% scale, replace the engines with an identical power plant to an Essex-class carrier, and upgrade the main armament on a gun-for-gun -gun basis by increasing its calibre by 4 inches. The ship's high speed and large size would also allow it to carry a formidable anti-aircraft battery, which would mean the ships were ideally suited for carrier escort in most circumstances, being able to hold off air attack, cruiser and destroyer attack, and even some of the older battleships still then in service, without having to tie down a full-size capital ship like one of the new Iowa class. <laughs> 
six of these ships would be authorised in 1940 as part of the Two Ocean Navy Act, which, as the name suggests, was designed to give the United States Navy enough firepower to fight a war against two enemies in two separate oceans at the same time. The primary armament would consist of nine brand new 12-inch 50 calibre high-velocity guns in three triple turrets. Laid out, as was now traditional, on treaty and post-treaty American capital ships, with a pair of turrets super-firing forward and a single turret aft. Thanks to the use of so-called super-heavy projectiles and improved propellants, although the shell velocity came down slightly from its overall potential, the guns actually had slightly superior armour penetration compared to some of the larger 14-inch guns found on the older standard battleships. The anti-aircraft armament, meanwhile, consisted of 12 of the ubiquitous 5-inch 38 caliber gun in six twin turrets, but with a more efficient broadside than might be, Im be imagined, as a pair of turrets were mounted on each side, but the final two were placed fore and aft of the superstructure, giving a broadside firepower of eight guns. And, of course, in keeping with the American policy of allowing almost every member of the crew a chance to exercise their Second Amendment rights in the face of the enemy, 14 quad mounts of the 40mm Bofors meant a total of 56 guns, along with 34 single 20mm Orlikans, which together would complete the ship's weapons loadout. Armour consisted of a belt with a maximum thickness of 9 inches, along with a 4-inch armour deck. The ships came in at just under 30,000 tonnes at standard load, and just over 34,000 tonnes at full load, with four screws using the 150,000 shaft horsepower to drive the ships at between 32 and 33 knots, depending on the ship, the loading and the weather. In 1941, during a rush to get as many carrier hulls in the water as possible, the ships did dodge rather much of a bullet in avoiding carrier conversion that task eventually landing on a number of incomplete Cleveland-glass-like cruisers. This was justified largely on the grounds that converting the Alaskas would actually take as long or longer than building a brand new fleet carrier, and the lack of significant underwater protection compared unfavourably with the Essex class, and eventually the wartime experience where almost every American fleet carrier loss had involved torpedoes as a significant factor. As a halfway house between cruisers and battleships, they were not judged worthy of state names, but were also too important for city names, so eventually it was decided to name the ships after US territories, the planned ships being Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Samoa, and Philippines, the last being technically a commonwealth. However, even America's mighty war industry did in fact have limits, and a shortage of capital ship grade steel and large slipways meant that only the first two were started promptly in late 1941 and early 1942, with Hawaii starting construction almost two years later. By the time the last three were due to be started, most of the Imperial Japanese Navy's cruiser fleet was already forming a series of interesting artificial reefs, largely courtesy of the attentions of US aviators and submariners. And the feared Japanese cruiser killers had rather failed to materialise. This left these ships without much of a specific purpose, since for about a third more money you could get an Iowa class, which had even more AA guns, full battle line capability, significantly better armour and underwater protection, and therefore more capacity to support the rest of the fleet. Or for about 12% more money, you could get two Baltimore class cruisers, which were perfectly fine in dealing with any remaining Japanese cruisers, collectively had a larger anti-aircraft battery, and of course could be in two places at once. And so the last three ships were cancelled. Alaska and Guam, meanwhile, would be launched in 1943 and commissioned in mid to late 1944, heading across the Pacific around the same time as some of the Iowa class, and, like the latter ships, found their roles in shore bombardment and carrier escort. In part, to allow the larger battleships to stay on station, the two would escort the USS Franklin to a repair yard after her significant damage at the hands of Japanese aircraft before splitting up. Alaska headed for Okinawa and Guam, 
heading up a cruiser force for a while before rejoining to raid Japanese shipping. But at this point in the war, the US Navy had sanitised the seas so thoroughly that in the middle of what should have been a key Japanese supply line through the East China and Yellow Seas, all they found were some somewhat bemused fleets of Chinese junks. Outside of this, the ships built up a good name as carrier escorts, since their designation as cruisers meant they were generally assigned to the close-in cruiser screens as opposed to the slightly more distant battleships. After Japan's surrender, they briefly supported US operations in Korea before being recalled to the US at the end of 1945. Despite less than three years active service, the running costs for the ships were incredibly high for what they were, and both were mothballed in 1947. Hawaii had been launched towards the end of 1945, but further work had been suspended, and as time went on, various studies suggested new uses for the ship. Much as it was proposed to convert the incomplete Iowa-class USS Kentucky to a guided missile battleship, a slightly smaller proposal to convert Hawaii to a guided missile cruiser was initially proposed, and then succeeded by an idea to turn her into a command ship, similar in purpose, but much larger than the freshly converted USS Northampton, which was a light cruiser successor to the name of the interwar heavy cruiser. However, none of this came to pass, and Hawaii would be sold for scrap in 1959. Alaska and Guam would then come under scrutiny once plans for Hawaii had fallen through. One proposal suggested stripping out all of the guns in favour of multiple missile systems, much like some variants of the then new F-4 Phantom Fighter. But this would cost more than building the ships had actually cost in the first place, in pure dollar value, so an alternate scheme that left the forward guns in place and only removed the rear turret and some of the 5-inch guns was considered. Although about 40% of the work, it still managed to come in at 50% of the cost, and thus was rated as still too expensive. Without any further ideas, and with the Iowas still available, the two ships would therefore be sold for scrap in 1960 and 1961 respectively. Now for the last bit. Should these ships be considered as large cruisers or battle cruisers? It's one of the most vexing questions for a naval historian, not helped by the fact that the United States Navy itself doesn't appear to have been entirely clear on the matter at times. At first, the ships were given the same appellation that the Lexington-class battle cruisers had been given in their initial form, CC. However, later on, this was changed to CB, which apparently stood for Large Cruiser, and then the US Navy went on a bit of a campaign to suppress any mention of them by their former designation. Displacement-wise, the ships were only just short of treaty battleships and were actually longer, due to the speed requirement, than a number of such vessels. Some of the arguments advanced on one side or the other are also self-contradictory. For example, the fact that the design was a scaled-up Baltimore-class cruiser is used to support the large cruiser designation, but at the same time, the Invincible class of the pre-World War I era were also slightly scaled-up versions of the period equivalent, the armoured cruiser. Their relative lack of armour protection and underwater defences compared to a battleship has also been used to support the large cruiser idea, but again, this wasn't exactly unknown on battle cruiser designs either. The percentage weight of displacement used for armour was similar to that of the Lexingtons, less than battleships or indeed HMS Hood, but much more than on the Invincibles. There's also the mission to consider. As we mentioned at the start, the Alaskas were explicitly designed to hunt down and destroy smaller and less well-equipped cruisers, with an additional capacity built in later in the design process to fight other similar cruiser killers which was also exactly the mission profile of the first battle cruisers. So, from all of that, you might think that I'm falling in on the side of those who call them battle cruisers. And for a very long time, you would have been right. But in the past couple of years, I've actually begun to agree more with the latter designation of large cruisers, mainly for two reasons. Firstly, whilst the parallels with the Invincible class are rather painfully obvious, 
the Invincible class were not originally battle cruisers. Their first designation, and mission profile, was as Dreadnought Armoured Cruisers, i.e. armoured cruisers with an all-big gun main battery. This is much more similar to a large cruiser designation, since it describes a ship that is simply bigger, more heavily armed, and a slightly protected better version of existing common cruiser designs. The scaled-down battleship, being the true form of a battle cruiser, is not actually a good argument for the large cruiser designation in its most commonly used form. As despite the battle cruisers carrying fewer guns and less armour than contemporary battleships, they were actually usually longer than the contemporary battleships. But on the other hand, arguing for this scaled down battleship approach, as seen in the British 13.5 inch battle cruisers and most of the German battle cruisers from the start, when viewed from the perspective of using the same calibre guns as battleships, just in smaller numbers, and generally having a similar armour layout, simply with slightly thinner plate, is probably a good candidate to what you might call true battle cruisers, which succeeded the Invincibles, and were much more strongly configured toward fighting their opposite numbers, and were definitely superior ships to the Invincibles. Therefore, the Alaska's design philosophy, reflecting the Invincibles, is at its core actually a relatively good argument for the enlarged cruiser idea. Secondly, one feature of all ships that are realistically called battle cruisers as opposed to uh, true fast battleships was a commonality of guns with their contemporary battleships, whether this was 11 inch, 12 inch, 13.5 inch, 15 inch or 16 inch guns. However, whilst their penetration capacity was similar to some older battleship guns, the fact is that the Alaskas were wielding 12 inch weapons that could not hold a candle to the 16 inch 50 caliber weapons wielded by their Iowa class contemporaries. And so this key feature of commonality, found on the classic battle cruisers, is also missing. Overall, therefore, my personal assessment now is that the Alaskas are more accurately described in naval historical terms as large cruisers, as they are essentially a World War II re-evolution of the Invincible class concept. However, given the ship's later redesignation and the general popular conception of battle cruisers, I can see why some people would prefer to use the battle cruiser appellative. So, of course, as always, feel free to make your own decision, since in some ways it really is a matter of opinion. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.